1971, a Technicolor Western starring John Wayne and Richard Boone hit the big screen. That movie's title was Big Jake. It was the final film for its director, George Sherman, who had been directing films for over 30 years. It was actually written to be titled The Million Dollar Kidnapping, and this was the title that was used during the early filming of the movie. The filming started in October of 1970 and ended in December of that same year. Exterior filming took place in the Mexican state of Durango, and it's interesting to note that John Wayne's son, Patrick, actually plays James McCandles in this movie. Robert Mitchum's son, Christopher, plays Michael McCandles. And then John Wayne's youngest son, Ethan, portrays little Jake. So this was definitely a family affair for John Wayne. After his grandson is kidnapped, there's only one man that can really get him back, and that's Big Jake, played by John Wayne. He's actually been away from his wife and family for almost 18 years and his sons barely know him. His wife, Martha McCandles, played by Maureen O'Hara, has been managing the family's ranch quite well without him. But now they find themselves in somewhat of a bind, and the family needs his help. You see, the outlaw John Fane, played by Richard Boone, and his gang attacked the McCandles' ranch, and they killed several workers and kidnapped McCandle's grandson, Little Jake. They left a note demanding a million dollars in ransom or they would kill the boy. Immediately, the Texas Rangers are called in. But as far as Martha McCandle's is concerned, there is only one person who she believes that she can trust to handle the money and the situation. And that's her estranged husband, Big Jake, played by John Wayne. He's a tough man that's larger than life. He knows the territory well, and he's completely accomplished with a gun. Big Jake sets out to rescue his grandson with his sons, and an old Indian scout friend named Sam Sharpnose, played by Bruce Cabot. Although the Texas Rangers are involved, Big Jake has his own way of dealing with the kidnappers. And he also has his own way of dealing with his sons, who are actually harboring a terrible resentment against him for leaving the family. The dangerous journey leads them all into Mexico to face the fiendish outlaw Fane and his gang. This was the final film in which John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara worked together. They had previously worked on Rio Grande, The Quiet Man, The Wings of Eagles, and McClintock. Maureen O'Hara had a real fondness for John Wayne. She considered him one of her best friends. She even went as far as to name a wing of her house after the actor. The house that she shared with General Charles Blair had an area called the John Wayne Wing. The director, George Sherman, was a close friend of John Wayne. Dating back to their days in the 1930s, making westerns at Republic Pictures. By the time of this film, though, Sherman was aging, and he wasn't in the best of health, and he really had a difficult time shooting in some of the wilds of Mexico. On the days when Sherman was unable to shoot because of his health conditions, John Wayne took over the direction. But when the film was finally completed, he insisted that Sherman alone be credited as the director. What a classy move from the Duke. Many of the actors in the cast were members of what's called John Wayne's well-known stock company. They continually starred together in John Wayne's movies. Chuck Robertson acted in over 21 movies and did over 30 movies where he did the stunts. Hank Warden did 15 movies. Bruce Cabot did 10, Patrick Wayne, his son, did 10, and Harry Carey Jr. did 9. Now, there are two collies trained by Robert Weatherwax and Rudd Weatherwax that played Dog, John Wayne's faithful companion. 
The two dogs were named Silver and Laddie, and one of those was actually Lassie Jr. They touched their coats up with an aerosol spray to make their coats look darker, but they were true collies. John Wayne was a little bit concerned about the movie's violence, and he insisted that they add plenty of comedy in this movie. The critics of the movie felt like that he added too much and ever can win. They would have said just the opposite if he hadn't have added any comedy. The automobiles that were driven by the Texas Rangers were REO Motor Car Company cars, and that was the name of an actual automotive manufacturer that was founded in 1905. REO stood for the initials of its founder, Ransom E. Olds, the same man who would found another company which would become Oldsmobile. Now, it's kind of interesting to note at the beginning of the movie, John Fane, played by Richard Boone, kills the McCandles foreman, played by John Agar. In the 1956 western, Star in the Dust, John Agar's character actually hangs Richard Boone's character. So I guess they're even with each other. The ranch house that they used for the McCandles Ranch is the same ranch house they used for the Chisholm Ranch in the movie Chisholm. Now that was the John Wayne Western that was done in 1970, the year before this movie. The major theme of this film is the use of modern technology. The year following this movie saw the debut of Heck Ramsey, in 1972. This was a television series starring the main villain in Big Jake, Richard Boone. This series was also set at the turn of the 20th century and focused on Ramsey's use of modern technology in police work. One of the pictures in the opening montage shows four outlaws lined up dead. There are labels over each of their heads. One of them says John Evans, another says Bob Dalton, Grat Dalton, and Dick Broadwell. Three of them were members of the ill-fated Dalton gang raid on two banks in Coffeyville, Kansas. The gang was ambushed by town citizens, and Bob Dalton, Bill Power, Grat Dalton, and Dick Broadwell were all killed there. Now, it's said that Maureen O'Hara wasn't really fond of the way this film turned out. She wasn't too crazy about the fact that her part was fairly small and marginal, but she went ahead and accepted it because it was John Wayne, her good friend, and she agreed to do it. She said she did enjoy working with all the character actors that she had dealt with through the years from John Ford's stock company. But she wasn't really pleased with the outcome of her shots with John Wayne, many of which were cut because of the film's excessive length. Early in the movie, Michael McCandles, played by Christopher Mitchum, shows up sporting a what at that time was a revolutionary pistol called the Bergman Automatic Pistol. But he proves that he's dangerously inept in handling this firearm. Thereafter, the weapon is carried by the more gun-handling James McCandles, played by Patrick Wayne. Bergman was indeed one of the earliest commercial manufacturers of automatic pistols, but they were produced in relatively small numbers, so surviving copies are very rare and quite valuable. Consequently, the weapon shown in the movie is actually a 1940s P-38, modified by the props department to resemble the much earlier Bergman pistol. Now, this was actually the last film that John Wayne and Christopher Mitchum worked together on. The two actors just had a falling out when Mitchum disagreed with John Wayne's conservative views. And this all happened on a television interview. This was on The Tonight Show. After the interview of The Tonight Show happened, They never spoke again. That Tonight Show segment aired June 7, 1972. And in it, they ended up talking about Proposition 13 that was on the ballot in California. See, John Wayne was very old school. 
and he believed that if you were an environmentalist, you were against business. And if you were against business, you were a liberal. He really was pretty rigid on some things. But if you look at old interviews with John Wayne, he makes a lot of sense on things. Chris Mitchum tried desperately over the years before John Wayne died to reconnect with him and to mend fences. The Duke never let go of their altercation. He never responded to him at all. This film's a great watch. If you haven't seen it in a while, take a look at it again. I watched it the other night and just really loved it. I forgot how good it was. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.